means that we are live. Uh, it's eight o'clock. It's Sunday night and you're watching Let's Kill Twitter with me, Julian Hall. This is the show that aims to detox your timeline with the art of conversation. Yes, it's quite a big ask, isn't it? Thankfully, I don't have to do that alone. Uh, tonight, I've got the fantastic comedian Pierre Novelli with me. But before I introduce Pierre, I want to just do a little bit of admin because it makes me feel good. Uh, we are now live across Twitch, across Facebook Live and across YouTube. So uh, the show will be available on YouTube afterwards. So if you know someone that's missed it, uh, please do direct them there. All our shows and all our clips are on YouTube. Uh, so it would be fantastic if you could give us a bit of a, a subscribe there. Um, crucially, on the uh, followers and subscriptions, it would be super if you could follow us at LKT Zoom, which of course is our Twitter handle, which is splashed liberally across this screen. Um, that If you do that tonight and you watch us live, you can send us your favourite tweets of the week, you can ask questions, send comments, make suggestions, what have you. Uh, we'll try and get around to those uh, uh, as much as we can. Uh, it's great to have the interaction there. And then the rest of the time, that's where we're putting out clips of uh, the next or the show that we're doing now, and we'll be sending out news of the next show, and generally trying to curate as interesting and as palatable collection of tweets as possible. So that is all you need to know. That's that's all the admin. So without uh, any further ado, uh, it gives me a great pleasure to introduce to you tonight to Pierre Novelli. He's one of the best up and coming stand ups in the UK. Uh, I've uh, known Pierre for a little while now and uh, always a pleasure to, to do whatever with Pierre. You may well be uh, aware of Pierre's work from The MASH Report on BBC Two, Stand Up Central on Comedy Central, The Now Show on Radio 4 and of course the hit, po the hit podcast Bud Pod with Phil Wang. Please welcome Pierre Novelli. Dun -dun -dun. You are now live and on screen. What a beautiful backdrop sir. Thank you. I live in a Victorian theatre. <laughs> or is that is that just uh, just reminding you of your uh, touring with Frank Skinner there? Yes, yeah, and also the general uh, um, nostalgia of uh, doing Zoom gigs uh, oh, gosh, and cool. having having to sort of go. Oh, I, I guess I could have a sort of theatrical digital background and create a kind of Muppet Show vibe when I do my. <laughs> I stand up. Yeah. And my, that might have been actually one of the last times that I saw you. I'm just going to share uh, the show to Facebook, which Restream should really be doing, but they really haven't. Um, I think the last time I might have seen you sort of in the flesh was supporting Frank um, at the Garrick, I think, was it? Yeah, that was the, the last uh, job I did before lockdown was um, run at the Garrick Theatre was from sort of 10th of January or something like that to the end of Feb until halfway through Feb, it was a sort of 30, 40 day, 40, like week, you know, whatever, four or five week run. Um, and then that sort of stopped. And mm, the next thing I was going to do was go to Melbourne. <laughs> so, and then, and then that's, and that's 2020 before it all kind of fell apart, yeah. really. Yeah, yeah. And then I, and then I got COVID two weeks before lockdown one. Right, I think I had. Were you diagnosed this is definite COVID, or are you pretty just pretty sure you had it? I mean, I lo I, I lost all sense of taste and smell ah, for like okay. five weeks, and it kept going for like months. And yeah, uh, yeah. that yeah. is the classic. And then I, I got some antibody stuff later, a few months later. Yeah, uh, I think there can be no doubt of of that. Yeah, I mean, yeah. We, we were just talking before we we streamed about how it was just so weird for comedians that they lost kind of all their sort of raison d'etre. I mean, how how has it been sort of picking up? And we've staggered through a lot of kind of new normals, haven't we, really? Yeah, it's all in weird little bursts. And then the fringe kind of happened with like two weeks notice and everyone just went, oh, fucking hell, what? And then... Yeah. <laughs> I do that. They do that before the, the real ones. But yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. A, yeah. But um, yeah, it was very strange because like um, the... Yeah, as I was saying to you before, I, I, I've done stand up pretty much without interruption for sort of eight to 10 years, depending. But certainly and like years and years, always going to the fringe and everything like that. So for it, it was like an enforced break off the hamster wheel. So you were off the hamster wheel and you could sort of look back at it and think, God, I was I was on that for a while, actually. And 
even if I decided to take some sort of mini sabbatical from stand up, it would never have been as long as a year and yeah. a half. So, no, exactly. yeah. and then, yeah, and then you realize, oh, I was going to like Devon or, 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 or sort of Manchester or, or places in like North Yorkshire for like one night or two nights. Um, and like my life was the, was so much travel based. And then I spent three months without getting on a bus or a train. Very strange. I must admit, I, it sort of it occurred to me, I don't know why, really, I was just musing about it during lockdown. It occurred to me that one of the things about being a stand up in the job description that it, it seems like the least palatable to me personally is all the traveling. Mm -hmm. it's, I just don't. I mean, I totally salute people that do it. I know there's a lot of camaraderie when you're getting lift back from other comedians and actually could well be the highlight of the night if, if it's been a weird gig. So I do, yeah. I sort of get that. But I mean, it's not always, there's a lot of presumably solo traveling and kind of just kicking around hotel rooms and yeah. I don't know, just weird, it's like general you, travel weirdness. <laughs> yeah, you get quite good at finding the cheapest accommodation solutions. Ah, uh, okay. So if you want to know where to, yeah, if you want to know where to stay, ask a comedian. Yeah, well, I suppose you are pretty expert, yeah. yeah. Is it if I mean people might not know, but when you get a job in a different city, unless it's unless it's so far away that you can't drive there in a day, um, they won't cover travel or accommodation. Yeah. So, yeah. If someone really wanted me to do a gig in Glasgow or definitely like abroad, Amsterdam, Luxembourg, Vienna, wherever these weird places where gigs pop up, then they'll offer flights and stuff, and then it's a much better deal because they want you to come all the way out there or whatever. But if it's anywhere within like driving distance of, of London, and driving distance includes up to a sort of six hour drive, seven hour drive, yeah. um, it's it's no, it's on you. Yeah, it's it's mad. So with with lockdown it, itself, and um, did you? Because you know a lot of people had a lot of time for reflection. You were saying before about certain people in certain jobs didn't notice uh, you know, the pandemic as much as others because you know, they were able to do other things. They were maybe working from home anyway, et cetera. But everyone had a certain amount of um, perspective to sort of draw, mm. to draw back on and maybe think, oh, I might change, you know, might change my life like this or I might tweak this. Although, I mean, I don't know whether pandemic, making decisions during a pandemic is a bit like making decisions during the Edinburgh Festival. It's like, don't, don't do it. <laughs> <laughs> but creatively was there a was there a kind of any sort of windows that opened up for your space or that you were glad of a disconnect yeah definitely i mean um i didn't realize well no i suspected like pre-pandemic if you'd said to me oh do you think that you sometimes use the fact that you're doing an edinburgh fringe run and an edinburgh fringe show which takes you know eight to ten months of prep um, you basically start a month or two after you've just finished the last end of a fringe. So do you think that you use that arc of sort of revising, getting ready, and then exams, you know, do the exams being the fringe, do you think you use that arc to avoid doing other work that you could be doing, like writing a book or a script or a pitch or whatever the fuck? <laughs> and I would have said yes, but I would have said, oh, like, I would have said yes, um, you know, 20% yes say yeah just okay. like a number from there Pande in the pandemic i had so much spare energy and stuff and i got so much other like i did write do a lot of writing i realized it's more like 80 or 90 percent yes right there's so much energy and so much time in the day if you make money from doing stand-up in the evening that you could be doing stuff but you can just go well i've got a preview tomorrow so i can just kind of think about my edinburgh show so look at listen to a recording of my edinburgh show um, the amount of energy and time it takes is so disproportionate to what happens for a month. Um, I hadn't realized proportionately what a time thief you could let it be. Again, this is a lack of discipline on my part, uh, just as much as it is <laughs> a, critique of, a critique of the grand casino of the Edinburgh Fringe. You know? So um, one of the other things we were sort of chatting about um, before we got started was, um, well, we were talking about restrictions, we were talking about what's coming down the line in the winter, whether maybe it's just a bit more sort of uh, levelling up, as it were, when by talking about England levelling up with Scotland and Wales and Northern Ireland. Um, what, how are audiences now uh, in terms of their eagerness to get out there? Obviously, they, were, they seem to be very eager at the start. They, I think they're still eager. Every now and then you'll look out and you'll see like it'll be a full audience with people basically sat next to each other, but a few masks here and there, um, but not many. And it's, it's also theater by theater. Some theaters are still super strict on it. Some don't give a shit. And 
<clears throat> I suppose it's confirmation bias, isn't it? Because I'm inherently only seeing audiences full of people willing to go out. Mm. So, mm, mm, mm. yeah, I literally can't meet the people who aren't willing. <laughs> so, <laughs> but I mean, I could... in terms of cancelled gigs or sparsely populated gigs or anything like that. Well, what was interesting at the Fringe, because I did seven nights or seven shows at the Fringe this year, the sort of Mad Max Fringe. Um, and what was interesting was that the number of shows was down by, you know, like 99%. Normally there's whatever, five and a half thousand shows and now there were like 90 or whatever. You know, just some crazy crash. But, but the audience numbers had also crashed, but but not as much. So there were actually more audience members per comedian. And myself and a lot of my friends who were up there all reported the same thing, which is that it was the easiest sold out. It was the easiest to sell out it's ever been. Right. Yeah. Because everyone was just kind of proportionately so well attended because people were just tooling around looking for stuff to do. There were lots more locals involved, like you're more, much more likely to have actual an actual Scottish person from actual Edinburgh in your crowd, which is not a given even for the whole month of the fringe sometimes. Um, yeah, so it was it was kind of it, it was sort of it was numerically worse. But for the people who went, it was also easier. So yeah and then and then now how how's it sort of back down in, in sort of london and surrounds in terms of gigs that all just seems to be pretty much pretty back normal. and busy and things yeah uh, the, the the few that i've done yeah I, do, um, I mean do you think people are going to sort of um get cold feet as it were i don't know because it's uh, in terms of age group i think that i don't know that it's going to really change the habits of the kind of you know under 45s in terms of coming out to gigs particularly yeah, well, that's it. And I, th I think those are the people who've been the most itchy for it anyway. And so, yeah, fair dues. Yeah. Right. So we must say good evening to superfan, uh, LKT superfan Martin. Hello, Martin. Uh, a trooper. Hello, Thanks for joining us again. Um, joining and engaging. Always very welcome. Um, so that's that's the real world uh, dealt with, Pierre. What, what about your life online in terms of uh, your likes, dislikes in terms of platform, social media platforms, how you like to approach Twitter, um, your sort of essentially, uh, yeah, predilections online, I suppose. I've, um, I've never been able to overcome my resentment as a comedian at the idea that social media is like another way that I have to just do work for free. And I have friends who are really good at Twitter and they get good stuff out of it and they get big opportunities sometimes, not all of them, but some of them. And it's because they put hours and hours and hours yeah. of work yeah. for free into feeding a different person's company's stock price in a, in a way to kind of like trick shot, ricochet off that company and kind of bing, get something out of it. And I just, I can't, Every now and then, with great mental effort, I could try and do a fucking joke or a little Photoshop or something. But I know people who like make time in the day to sit and, and feed the beast, you know. Yeah. And I just, I'm not getting paid. <laughs> the whole point of doing this is that I want to do this stuff for money because I'm a professional. So I just, I'm very, very bad at that. If I was better, if I was more relaxed about the fact that I'm just working for free to make someone else's website more appealing, I'm sure I would have more followers on the website. Um, but overall, I, I think, I don't know, I'm very torn. It can be very good, but it's like a, it depends how you use it, doesn't it? Whereas I think, um, and the payoffs yeah, for I, some people, you mentioned Alistair Beckett King when we were, again, when we chatted yeah, earlier, you he's, know, he's nailed it. I mean, his videos are incredible. They look like professionally made things, um, that he's, he learned like animation and the CGI in there kind of as well. And like green screening amazing and then it's funny as well so like th those things go mega mega viral and you see them popping up you know when a friend of yours has gone viral when you see their shit popping up on other websites and people going oh look at this guy like un like stealing it like kind of uncredited reposts yeah yeah um, totally so do you find that do you find that sort of do you find that tempting or because uh, i kind of understand where you're you're coming from in terms of the ethos it's yeah it's a, it must be quite a, a, a little bit of a dilemma actually yeah the only way that it makes sense is because tweets are so short, right? And you can't do much with them. Because if someone said to you, well, if you write a book for free and just hurl it out the window of your car, 
then maybe someday people will pay you to write a book. Maybe if you, if you write, if you write maybe a free book every, every month or two, then eventually, you know, but because they're little and you can kind of just throw them out there. Presumably um, that's a car that's sort of driving very slowly around Bloomsbury or, uh, you know, yeah, 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 yeah <laughs> wherever exactly, the yeah. publishers are now um, along street, the river. Street, street um, or wherever. Yeah. 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 And, yeah. and I just like, I'm also like my, my style of comedy is more like bit based as opposed to like one liner thoughts. So yeah. Yeah. I'm also just less stylistically suited to it, but I, I sort of, I mean, look, I, I have a pod, I do a, I do that podcast, Blood Pod, with with Phil Wang, and that's like an hour a week of free content that I, I sort of we <laughs> Gr- grudgingly edit. release. So that, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I, I'm. It's not like I'm. <laughs> it's not like I'm not feeding the beast free content. Yeah. Uh, I am, but like the podcast is something that I don't resent because we don't write it. I don't have to sit and go. How will I talk to my very very good old friend today about? something i want to talk about anyway whereas the tweet thing it, and and you have to kind of do the you have to speak the language of memes which i i i do but i kind of resent the idea that memes are this way that like uh i think sometimes if you're funny with a meme it's a bit like being funny like it's like paint by numbers so you go look how beautiful this is and you go well yeah but you just filled it in yeah i mean do you there's a self the self-promotion aspect for yourself and also for the the podcast so you'd less resent promoting the podcast on various social media presumably yeah i'll tweet even. about that yeah. and post on instagram or whatever because i think it's good and i like doing it whereas the idea of just sort of it's it i think i don't like it because it seems strategic and insincere to sort of go what are the popular memes and then sort of finding them and sort of going who's who's being goaded into killing themselves this week and sort of filling in their name in the meme. And it's this very like sociopathic approach to humor, uh, consciously or unconsciously. It's very like assembly line stuff. And it, it doesn't feel like real or organic. It, it, it doesn't, it doesn't occur to me naturally. I yeah. guess if it occurs to you naturally, you do feel sincere. Cause you go, oh, I just, I just thought of this great tweet, but it doesn't occur to me naturally. And I don't really understand what makes things go viral and what doesn't so, apart from one thing i know that things go viral if by sharing them you make yourself look morally superior i know that <laughs> which is it's not really uh, what a comedian necessarily would naturally give give themselves towards to be fair so uh I, no I, you'd I, think yeah. but <laughs> well yeah well, i mean there are some exceptions yeah um yeah. what what about in terms of glean sort of gleaning information from social media i mean do you find it do you find it useful? In fairness, most guests come on and they say, you know what, if I didn't do this job, I would not be on social media. And that seems to be the yeah. bottom line. Um, yeah, I think the only way that if, if I did a different job, the only way I would ever be using something like Twitter is if like, the only other people I know who really get good stuff out of it are very particular like niche academics. So, um, okay. yeah. for, Example, I have a, I, I did a degree in Anglo-Saxon, Norse and Celtic studies. Oh, uh, yes. And uh, so I follow my old, you know, tutor and some of my old lecturers and friends of mine from that, from that course on Twitter. And they live in a different Twitter to me because they just live in early medieval history Twitter and they only follow people who have to do with that. And so it's like this really, for them, Twitter is this highly specialized weapon and research tool and I can see their retweets, like they'll retweet some guy, some professor in, uh, uh, you know, Budapest saying, does anyone have a spare copy of, of um, 10th century Welsh manuscripts by James, you know, Griffith or whatever, volume three. And then <laughs> people will help each other out with it. Oh, I'll, I'll send you a picture of the page you're looking to cite for your research. <laughs> that looks great. That their, their version of it looks like a wonderful place to, to, to help and network with your colleagues, but it's true. And I guess it can like it, be done. Yeah, can be done, and okay. they have that. They have that version of it. And I guess if you were like, let's say that you were, yeah, I don't know, a human rights activist or a lawyer or whatever, you could just follow like fifty highly specialized Twitter accounts, and just fucking mute everything else. <laughs> um, but yeah, the the <laughs> the trouble with doing something where you're just trying to get people to to you. 
is that you can't, the more communities you shut yourself out of, the harder you're just making the reason you're on there. It's just occurred to me, just talking about the book, the sort of academics looking for a book, it just occurs that J.R. Hartley would have found fly, fly fishing so much quicker with Twitter. Um, <laughs> obviously, that's a pretty dated reference, but thank you for getting it <laughs> before an age gap opens true. up. Um, yeah, that's true. Bro. Yeah, no, I mean, that's, that's a good... It can, yeah, okay, so that's... It's essentially you've got to build... You've got to build a bit of an echo chamber to kind of yeah. get that vibe. But. but but even then, even then, no one is immune because you could be just following all these fellow academics of yours and one of them could retweet a James Bond spoiler or or one of them could could <laughs> just decide to, to to tweet something about their fucking lunch. And then it's ruined and the, the bubble is, is burst, isn't it? The fantasy is destroyed. This is true. This is very true. And have you got sort of any love for Facebook or Insta or? Instagram seems more friendly because one of the reasons that Twitter makes people so angry is that A, they've done that thing where you, unless you tell it repeatedly, you don't see latest tweets first. And I had a friend who didn't even realize Twitter had done that to her. And I was like, you know, you can just see the latest tweets, right? You don't have to, you don't have to put up with this fucking shit where you just see tweets that someone who you don't know has replied to and she, it was a revelation um because that was what twitter used to be like but even then through retweets you see stuff that's not for you mm. Mm. so you're it's being forced on you whereas instagram you can just go on there and only see things that you've at least nominally said you want to see okay um, yeah until they fuck that up but it's also just owned by facebook and facebook is largely evil um <laughs> Well, but um, no one, but yeah. no one, no one in my age group really goes on Facebook no, anymore. It's dead. It's pretty dead. Um, yeah, it's dying, and they're going to rebrand it. Apparently, it was in the news this week. That's right. It? Yeah, yeah. I just actually, that, I probably got some tweets uh, on that. Uh, you just reminded me. I've got a couple of, I've got a couple of reserved tweets. If we get to them, um, <laughs> I mean, the thing about the, the thing about Insta that was always sort of slightly weird to me is you can't actually you can't share anything. I mean, yeah. you post it, and uh, I don't know. Just but then you ask yourself, what am I, what am I sharing? Or I guess you can you, you can do stuff in such a way that it comes up for people's discovery page or whatever. Right. Yeah. Um, but you, it's that's the thing that makes Twitter and Facebook so much more toxic. I think is that it forces you to create a, a projected self, doesn't it? Where you go, what would the ideal me look like? And I'll share along that oh, line. I, you know? Surely that is Insta all over. This is the ideal me eating the ideal food. This is, I mean, it's such a lot to me. It's such a lifestyle brochure. It's like oh, it's definitely, oh, it's definitely a lifestyle brochure. Right. But I mean, like uh, on on Twitter or Facebook, people sort of go, I'm I'm going to needlessly share an opinion on a, on an issue, and it's sort of like, but you're not a spokesman for anything. You're you're just some fucking guy. <laughs> But otherwise, you're the guy who never posts, right? So you go, well, I, the, every time I log in, the little thing is saying, hey, what's, tell us what's going on. Yeah, what's there. on your mind? Begging for my opinion. Yeah. Hey, they asked, you know, they asked me. Whereas in reality, no one asked you anything. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, right, let's see what Martin's chipped in. Facebook is only really good for Messenger. Uh, Twitter's really for ordinary Joes like me and pro creatives to talk nonstop or promote their paid work. I can't imagine musicians or photographers putting stuff here for free. Why should comedians? Yeah. That yeah, actually, yeah, that's the only. There are occasionally some really good. Um, some photographers put some of their back catalogue, like photos of London from the eighties and stuff like that. Yeah. And so yeah. there are some like amazing curios where which you know I might not otherwise see. Um, yeah. So I, there is a there is a lot to be said for it. I, I mean. I, you know, when I started the show, it was meant to be a very double-edged sort of uh, let's kill Twitter nudge nudge because there was a kind of, I was paying homage to it as well as trying to sort of go for its yeah. weaknesses, which is obviously not hard. Um, yeah. But I mean, I, as I I do sort of undulate in terms of, I mean, you'd expect that with a news agenda anyway in the way that that changes yes. that some weeks Twitter is a hellish place to be and other weeks, another week's less so. There is, would yeah. Did you see the news about Twitter realizing that its algorithm sort of fucked in terms of promoting right wing politicians over left wing politicians everywhere except Germany? Weirdly, in Germany, they, it was by in the other direction. But um, they 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 still don't know why. They just can see that the results are not equal. Well, that's yeah, that's weird. 
That's weird. I mean, I think obviously there are some people on the right that would argue that Twitter's sanctioning of, uh, well, it depends how right, how far right we're going, but Twitter's sanctioning of uh, right wing people compared to left wing people if they're if they're sort of violating hate, sort of hate speech and all the rest of it has been a bit askew. But it is obviously quite, you know. Well, a, they're, they're, but then like they're benefiting from. Yeah, like uh, it was like a massive amount. It was like an extra like forty percent, forty five percent, like of of like if, if you're just some guy, you're more likely to be shown content from their side than the left wing side. Um, but either way, like all the, uh, and like all the stuff with Twitter's um, image uh, preview algorithm never showing you black people, um, things like that. It, we're 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 so far from known territory here and in terms of its effect on people like it does seem to destroy people's fucking brains <laughs> it, it i think it kills people's brains I, I i really do mean that and i think yeah it has it has occurred to me that on, on balance it, it might not be such true it might not be such a good thing i have this there's been a learning curve doing this this show uh i have to say i think it's one of those things where like like we've said like if it's a highly specialized mm. feed and whatever but but beyond that if you just let loose on it it's just some guy who's you know bed bound you're gonna lose your fucking mind i mean i think there is an element of um twitter fulfilling that adage of uh a little knowledge is a dangerous thing and twitter <laughs> obviously yes. really feeds that and i and, and i say that sort of i know you know don't have to be even handed about this on one on one level i do like i do like to sort of cherry pick certain things i do like to know a little bit about uh, what's going on with particular issues maybe abroad that I wouldn't already ordinarily do but does that mean that what that really should mean is that then I go off and jump off and I buy I buy a book about I don't know uh, cap the, the new book about Capitol Hill riots that's come out or something like that. that's what I should really be doing but I guess yeah. at least my awareness is there that I could you know I can do that but doing yeah the reading and... is obviously very important that you know well, it also like no one has faith in institutions anymore, right? No one trusts the government or the police or the justice system or the army or whatever, like the, whatever the institution in your country is like all over the world, but especially in the West, people don't have faith in institutions. And so Twitter doesn't cause that, but it does weaponize it in the sense that you sort of go, well, why would I go do the reading from the 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 fucking people I don't trust. This guy who's got his own you know YouTube channel and seems to be obsessed with the frogs being gay. He seems like a <laughs> he's not part of the establishment. Just look at him. He's insane. They had, I'll listen to him, and it gives people an alternative avenue. And then everyone gets a bit postmodern. If you talk, if you well, not talk to, but you look at these conspiracy theorists and stuff, they always end up sort of going. You sort of go, well, why should they go? Well, why should we trust them? And you go, well, they, you know, they, they've worked in all these prestigious newspapers and whatever. And they go, well, yeah, well, people only get on those newspapers because of who they know. And you go, okay, but then they went to a good university and they got they're smart, like they have good qualifications. Yeah, that don't, those don't mean anything in the real world. You go, okay, well, <laughs> they've done all this research. They go, yeah, who'd they talk to? Because my guy talked to someone else. It's just completely undermined everything that does mean something traditionally and they've replaced it with a guy with nothing because they've gone well at least i know he has nothing and he reckons stuff because i already suspect that of the other guy and the other guy's lying about it yeah. it creates all these weird equivalences and i don't know i think overall i would turn it off <laughs> hey let's just do that let's just do it halfway through as a protest <laughs> yeah well Twitter we can't thing. we can't do that because we're actually going to get to your tweets now before we do get to your tweets what's um What's the deal with uh, online anonymity with you? What's your view on that? Um, the trouble is that you, if you get rid of it, well, in fairness, people always say like, oh, but if, if you couldn't do something anonymously, then you know we wouldn't have tweets and Facebook posts and whatever that are in dictatorships. But the fact is that any dictatorship with any decent grasp of technology has already non-anonymized you i mean if you're in china and you start really fucking around they'll just find you it's already too late for that um yeah so what i i, I don't know i thought there, there could be a halfway house where your posts are moderated or filtered heavily unless you sign up with like your driver's license or something right okay and so so the real thing is that Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, all these things are desperate not to be legally branded publishers, right? Because publishers are responsible for what they put out. Yeah. 
in the same way that newspaper owners are responsible for the stories they print, they can be sued, they can go to jail, etc. in theory. Obviously never in real life, but still in theory. So if you'd rebranded Twitter as a publication platform, and then you say, okay, because we are a publisher now, we have to filter all of your fucking tweets. So a lot of them are probably never going to see the life of light of day if you're just some nutter. But if you sign up with your driver's license, like you're signing up to a, a, a some sort of financial services app or your, your bank account, online banking, you sign up driver's license, whatever, then, and you sign a thing, terms and conditions, you say, whatever I publish, I'm publishing it. I'm the publisher now. Yeah. I yeah. hereby say, yeah. don't sue Twitter, sue me for libel, slander, whatever. Mm -hmm. Then you would have the kind of all bases covered at once, maybe. I don't know. But the idea that like, you know, you know the, the, the Arab Spring, everyone said it was Twitter and Facebook. Mm. But apparently in Egypt, for a lot of that happened, the main social media thing that they were using at the time was Live Journal. It wasn't Twitter or Facebook. The um, just... blog platform. Yeah, and in the West, it's just that no one uses Live Journal anymore. So we were like, well, it's not I'm sure I've used Live Journal. I don't know how anything happened. I mean, it must, I'm surprised it didn't happen more slowly. But anyway, yeah. good Lord. But yeah, I, th I think, I think if you're in a sufficiently technologically advanced dictatorship, it's already not anonymous. So mm -hmm. I don't know. I don't know. But I, I, people lose their goddamn minds when... And also, I mean, even in the UK, people have been tracked down through their tweets and arrested. Yeah, no, it has, absolutely it has happened. Yeah, but It has happened already. It's just that the police can't... The police don't have the time or the energy or the inclination to do it for everyone. Well, I mean, it's... Yeah, exactly. And it's all just about the gravity of whatever the, the sort of the misdemeanor or worse has been because... Yeah. Yeah, no, totally. So listen, yeah. let's 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 get onto your uh, selection. I'm 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 glad you're here to talk me through them. I mean, obviously they're your selection, but also I totally need them explaining. Um, yes, because I'm so, being, being a bit thick. Shall we, do you have a preference which one we start with? Well, I can just say overall, I I chose these three because they're the sort of thing that makes Twitter, like, so. What I wanted was to get three tweets which illustrated, I've curated my Twitter feed by like muting words and phrases and and turning off other people's retweets so much okay. that I've almost got it down to these good like things that I like. Wow. So I'm seriously impressed. <laughs> so I thought, so I thought there's so much of Twitter I hate that it would actually be faster for me to show you the bits that I like and you can just assume I hate the rest of it. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. Absolutely. Yeah. Fair enough. Um, it's like I've it's like I've drawn a circle around my feet and declared that I'm on the outside of the planet, like yeah. you know, like on, on the globe. I'm on the outside; everywhere else is enclosed. It's a bit like the uh, so Hitchhiker's the last book in Hitchhiker's the Gal Guide to the Galaxy, where he makes a house. He makes a house for the world, but it's oh. inside, the house is inside out, so everybody lives technically in that house, and he lives outside it or something. Yes, anyway, yes. it's just bringing flashback memories there. So which which one should we start with? I mean, you, uh, look, I'm tempted to start with like the, the one that I totally flummoxed me. Uh, actually, so, for, the, for the podcast um, listeners, uh, this is a tweet from, because I don't know that you'll necessarily be reading this one out. Uh, you can do, though. Uh, it's from Post Cronhib. Um, and, well, actually, we should, yes, let's just read that out of the bio, which is uh, David uh, Stifter, is it? Professor yes, of old, uh, old and Middle Irish at Maynooth University. And the tweet, uh, yeah, I mean, do you want to read it out? <laughs> well, so, okay, so I only, I, I only see these tweets through a friend's retweets. Well, and we can accept that. <laughs> yeah, I like them because from what I can glean, <laughs> <laughs> this is a professor or an academic of old Irish at, at Maynooth University, and he's comparing um, Japanese poetry from the 11th century, 10th century, 9th century, with what was being written in poetry in Irish at the same time. Okay. And with like different themes and stuff. So it's very, very niche and in-depth. Like I was saying, there's, there's people I follow where this is the world they live in. They just see these nice, interesting, weird little things. And basically it's, um, it's a, it's a, I don't even, I don't even know. It's a poem. It's not a haiku, is it? No. So it's the, the poem. So, okay. So that's, 
that's the source at the top, then it ends. So it's at, at daybreak. So Agura yeah. Hayakunin, issue 64. And then Fuji... That must be what it was published in. Oh, uh, yeah, issue 64. And then Fujiwara no Sadayori, a.k.a. Gon Shunagon, professional middle counsellor. Um, Sadayori... Oh, so the nine... Oh, yeah, so that's the citation of where it is, presumably. Um, yeah, I think so, yeah, in the book. So the, the poem... Well, the, the poem just says, At daybreak, mist over the river Uji, gradually emerging all around. Fish weir stakes in the rapids. And then there's more. And then if you scroll down that Twitter thread, he, you see it written out, anglicized, and then in Japanese. And then you see the old Irish poem, which was um, 300, that was their number on the path to that assembly. So through this illusory fog to that fight, not one cow of this herd was alive. Which I think is about a battle or something. I'm not even sure. I don't know, but I just like seeing it. I like seeing it. I have no idea what the fuck is going on. <laughs> I've never quite seen a tweet like it, I have to say. Yeah, and then and then there's a bit more detail the further down you oh, scroll, but it's incredibly in-depth um, <laughs> and a kind of comparison that you would never think of to, to compare um, the work of these poets with sort of bits of old Irish like across the world. And then there's like an analysis of the Japanese poem. Um, so it's basically for free. We are seeing a very interesting bit of academic uh, academic work from uh, presumably I don't know the guy, an expert in his field, a cool guy. I don't know, maybe <laughs> Tolkien would have liked this. Says Martin, yeah. he's being retweeted by a friend of mine, so I guess he must be a pretty cool guy. Well, and he's analyzing it and and going into it. And this is the sort of thing that if you you have to curate your life so brutally to even have access to. And um, that's quite some honing that you've done to, to find it. And I mean, is there yeah. a kind of conclusion? Where's the punchline, Pierre? Come on. <laughs> <laughs> this is all very well, but you know, where's the, the knock punch, gag? <laughs> the punch the punchline here is is how exhausted I must be with so much of comedy that this is the sort of thing that I'd rather see on my feed. Wow. Although to be fair, the other two tweets I've sent you are, are things I think are incredibly funny or or, or people I think are incredibly funny. Yes, no, true. Well, let's let's go to them now. That is, uh, I mean, I do I do like the fact that they they they've broken down. As you say, you're getting something for free that would have you know it would have been inaccessible otherwise. But yeah, um, of the, <laughs> the aristocrats. Aristocrat. and they call that the aristocrats exactly, Martin. Yeah. So uh, right, let's go to uh, so so Johnny White. Johnny White, yeah. really, really. Okay, so tell me, yeah. tell me about Johnny. Well, let's let's read the, the tweet and then we can talk about it. So there's, there's tweets from uh, Johnny W, and he's at Johnny with an H, W really X2. So Johnny White really, really, uh, he's a, a genius, I think, comedian. And the tweet is, bit of personal news, I sleep on my side, open bracket, S, close bracket. Um, and he, um, his, his albums are available on Bandcamp, his comedy albums, and he records them without an audience, which I think is perfect wow. because his stuff's quite um, poetic and esoteric and interesting. And I think without that, you're, you're going to listen to them with the level of attention they deserve without the distraction of being told when to laugh by some crowd or um, he's really sort of quite alternative comedian, I guess, like without, he doesn't like props or anything, but just in terms of his material, his approach and things. And I'm just, I just got a bit obsessed with him a few years ago and then, I met him and hung out with him a few times and he's a very nice guy. So he's one of the people who he's, I look forward to his tweets. It's every, everyone's a, everyone's a hit with me. Um, they're sort of odd or esoteric or, or sarcastic or a funny analysis of something. And he also tweets about um, how exhausting he finds um, meme formats that begin like tweet formats that begin with can't stop thinking about. Yeah. Or, um, uh sex is good or sex is good but have you ever yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. and the idea that someone is like um oh yeah like someone's tweeting about something that they actually you can tell that they hate and resent and they're like literally crying with laughter right now can't believe it when you go but you're not you're lying your face is absolutely dead as you type this <laughs> you know you're not even smiling on you're on your own in a dark room tweeting this like it's not you can something about reading people describing what a great funny laughing time they're having when you know they're not is really nails on a blackboard to me i find it sort of sinister and like yeah 
aggressive in a way that I can't quite define, to be honest. I mean, I just, I, well, I'm, t- I'm really simple. We'll go back to Johnny in a minute because I don't want to let, let yeah. go of, uh, of this enigma that is Johnny. But um, uh, you, yeah, I mean, look, we've got emojis now of the, the highest state of life laughter that you could possibly get, which is the crying with laughter, which probably happens to most people if they're discerning yeah. enough about five times in their life or maybe 10, I don't know. But, but let's, now it's like the accepted say, reaction. Uh, yeah, let's say once a year even. Once a year, that sounds like a good average, yeah. But yeah, and everyone's just sending cry face, cry face to everything. Teen, te- the, the teens on t- on TikTok are apparently sending, they send the skull emoji. What, for laughter? Yeah, yeah as in like, I've died, laugh, oh, like I'm okay. dying. Right, right, right. I'm dead, I'm dead. I've laughed so much, I'm dead, I'm dead. <laughs> Um, you can't well, you can't the, get past that can you well yeah there you go yeah exactly but it's still just like no you're not <laughs> <laughs> you're not dead you're not crying laughing you're not laughing you may have, over, you may have oversold this yeah yeah this may be a bit much now it's yeah it's any of that kind of like ostentatious it would be as it's as disconcerting to me as if you told someone a joke in real life and they went ha 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 <laughs> or if they just said that is funny to you, like a kind of robot man. Yeah, it's, it's just the upper end of, yeah. It's something really otherworldly about it. And like I say, like the thing with like, oh, I can't, st- ever since I, I can't stop thinking about how, and you go, well, you, you, you can stop thinking about it. You don't think about it much at all. You're just saying that now as a way to get people to read this tweet. Well, it's just like, I mean, you know, it's like, this is everything or all that kind yeah. of thing. It's just like, we're so maxed out on, you know, all that kind of stuff. It's like, oh, every, well, clearly the best is behind us. <laughs> every every human experience has to leave you bleeding from the mouth and anus with shock and awe. <laughs> or it's worthless. It's one or the other. Yeah. And it's exhausting to read because your mind has to make it like, in the same way that it's exhausting to read capital, everything in capitals, because your mind is yeah. shouting. It makes you tired. C- capitalized and, emotions, totally. It's a, exactly. Thing. And And... The, the the humorous tweets were like can't stop thinking about it's the personal humor equivalent of a buzzfeed listicle you won't believe number 14 like uh or what these people look like now it it does no one's arguing it it doesn't work it does work but that's what makes it depressing is that it works and um so yeah so johnny's uh so let's just have a look actually hang on um gosh, yeah is it is it english or american he's or english. He's, he's english yeah um he's english and he does stand up um around london i think he's doing a show in november uh on november the 15th he's been tweeting about that um i just think he's a genius if you if you find him on Bandcamp and listen yeah i just think he's so <laughs> so fucking funny because he's it, it, it's intelligent, but it's still a bit silly or it requires a bit of thought. There's depth to it. I just think it's great. And Twitter is kind of perfect and not perfect for him at the same time, I think, because he gets to tweet these kind of odd esoteric things like this one about I sleep on my sides yeah. and the idea of that dr- dressing that up as a bit of personal news. <laughs> Very funny. But like... I'm surprised it he had a klaxon as well, you know. Yeah. 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 <laughs> It's so like that's that's funny, but even that will not like spread as far as it should because this it's being out retweeted by a bunch of fucking format based meme nonsense from some lad Bible account, you know. So at the same time as he's being able to advertise his unique sense of humor through Twitter, it's also being washed or the obscured mm. by a cloud of bollocks from the worst stuff. Whereas maybe like in the early days, it would have. You know, if we'd all got in on the ground floor, then the good stuff would have just managed to get so far ahead that it was prominent now. But now it's just this morass, you know. I've definitely made yeah. a note to check out Bandcamp there. Definitely. Yes, yeah. yes. he's It's great. Really funny. Good, yeah. Good stuff. Good stuff. Always nice to discover someone new. Um, yeah. Someone not so new, obviously, uh, <laughs> Glenn Moore. Yeah. Uh, right. Let's, yeah. let's go right wild with this one. So Glenn is one of the few people I know who uses Twitter absolutely perfectly. Like he's like um, Neo in the Matrix or whatever. He can fly and he can, he just tweets jokes or funny thoughts. That's it. That's it. So he's the perfect person to follow. There's never a reason to mute him or unfollow him unless you're insane. Um, 
and take things too seriously, which of course is how you people live on Twitter. So there's a there's, that's not a small group of people, but Glenn just smashes it every time. And and even this thing where like I was actually in the so it's Glenn's uh, tweet is he says a screenshot of a WhatsApp conversation. He said really annoyed myself this evening and those around me. And I'm sure he won't mind, but I'll dub him in. He the screenshot of the conversation actually happened a while ago. Okay. Like it's it's not from the time that he's saying that's the yeah, conceit. Yeah, yeah. But he's got the kind of brain where he sort of goes. I don't know, somewhere in his brain, he just remembers, oh, there was that funny thing and I can just put it out there and it's just free. Do we, uh, can we uh, is it okay, to, can we read it out for the podcast? Yes, yeah. yeah. So uh, he's, it's a WhatsApp conversation where Glenn uh, messaged me and some other people, guys, I've come up with the laziest, most dog shit million pound idea that all the most boring people you know will love. A book called Wuthering Fucking Heights. And it's literally just word for word Wuthering Heights, but with a bit of swearing in every sentence. So like, she opened up the cocking window. I know I've made this up, but I fucking hate it so much. <laughs> and you know what? He's right. I mean, like, you know, the whole thing with Pride and Prejudice and Zombies? Uh, no, what have I missed? So they published a version of Pride um... and Prejudice where they just put zombies in it and it was the same basically but now, now there's like zombies attacking or whatever and then they tried they, they got like a movie deal oh it did um, i was just gonna ask yeah yeah, yeah. Right, right, and right. it's it sold loads of copies and and so on but there's a, such an appetite for like twee victoriana yeah bonnets with like a kind of modern silly thing kind of smushed into it like people love that shit it's very you know uh gin o'clock <laughs> um and so it's a great piece of sort of observational comedy and parody and whatever that he's done just in this whatsapp group and so he's at the news at glenn i'm sure everyone already follows him but it, it's he's again like one of the people who he creates value in the in the feed yeah. and very few people create value in the feed at all and it's all that glenn does so if everyone was just like glenn <laughs> well, glenn would be less unique but yeah <laughs> well yeah but I, I just mean in terms of their sentiment right. towards their output as opposed to as funny i mean yeah yeah um He's he's such a a professional about it, and I I do envy how he can be bothered. I'm just maybe I'm just lazy. Maybe at the end of the day, Julian, I'm angry at myself for being fucking lazy. <laughs> but it's I mean it, it, look, it is a lot of honing time, and if you've got other you know if you've got, you've got other things fish to fry, then it's 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 a distraction. It, it could be a distraction that's on brand, and it absolutely is for for Glenn. Or yeah. Alistair or, or Matt Green or, you know, what have you. But um, yeah. it can't be on brand for everyone, no. No, and I, I just can't, like... I've, I've tried it a few times, but, like, the stuff that I've done that's ended up doing really well and getting a lot of retweets is always stuff that I just think, really? Okay. Like, I just don't understand how the machine works. And I'll tell you what. I'll tell you a, an open secret right now. I have a tweet that I do on the same day every year and it always does really well. And I just do it. I just do my annual good tweet and it always works. <laughs> and the way it works, Julian, is that on the hottest night of the year in the Northern Hemisphere, I tweet, quote, it's like trying to sleep inside a fucking McDonald's apple pie. Oh, yes. Yeah, I've seen that tweet. Yeah. And I tweet that every year on the hottest night of the year. <laughs> And it always gets enormous engagement. And um, it's because it's based on the incredibly common observation that the center of the McDonald's apple pie oh, is yeah. very hot. Yeah. And the apple pie is slaped, shaped a bit like a sleeping bag. Um, you can sort of imagine climbing into it. And you need to tweet it around the time that people are compulsively hate scrolling through twitter as they're trying to go to bed <laughs> so they <laughs> are too warm and they see it and if you time that all right it's your ed ball it's your ed balls tweet it's my ed balls tweet is and, and it's a different day every year because of the the variability oh, yeah. of the so, well yeah totally i was gonna say you might have struggled this year to find what was the last day yeah. <laughs> the, i think this, this year <laughs> yeah it's a movable feast and this year i don't think this year was a good year for the tweet no, um, it was. Uh, it's been. A, it's been a challenging year. Um, now I must admit, I normally. Um, I I don't know if we're following Glenn. You know. Oh no, we are following Glenn. That's because I did follow all the people we've had on the show, and people that they've brought up on the show. So I'm just worried that Glenn's must follow says Martin, of course. 
and no hecklers was uh, was uh, on Johnny's. The fact that he does his um, yes, yes, band camp with no audience. That is really interesting. Actually, I just want to just listen to it just for that alone, really. Um, yeah, and he's he's quite sort of softly spoken and 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 thoughtful. And so when you do watch him live at the Fringe, and there is like a rowdy couple in the front row or something, you do sort of think you do sort of get the impression that they sort of go to break a butterfly upon the wheel, you know, where you sort of think, can't you see that what's happening in front of you now is a kind of wonderfully delicate act of quite subtle, clever comedy with like, whim like a bit of craziness thrown in or sort of like unexpected twists and things. But if you'd only be quiet and listen, it's not club comedy. It's not Saturday night hen and stag comedy. No, um, no. So I prefer it without an audience, which is rare. I mean, imagine having content so good that you don't need the, the like, like, I'd be the first to admit that comedy is very dependent on the pack mentality being induced yeah. in people, definitely. Whereas his kind of isn't. It's almost like it could stand up as prose in its own right. Yeah. I mean, and also just to, just to get the rhythm, you know, you know, if he's doing that without needing the feed, as it were. Yeah, that's it. Without the feedback, it's just it, it it holds itself confidently without it. Yeah, very interesting. But so like those that's these are examples of the ways that it could Twitter could be good. <laughs> I'm showing I'm showing the potential alternate reality now. But I mean, it's 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 it is your alternate reality, though, isn't it? I mean, it's I mean, even the even the uh, the, the sort of historians that you were talking about earlier, uh, they would not necessarily, uh, you know, let glenn into their feed if they were being quite purist about it well that's it yeah but you know we could all this i suppose the 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 thing is is that twitter creates a circuit of circumstances where the only way for it to be tolerable is to create an echo chamber but equally yeah. when people venture outside of their echo chamber on twitter often it's just to directly fucking abuse people <laughs> um right yeah and i i do think that there is a correlation between people I know who on Twitter are quite nasty or mad or a bit over the, li over the line. And then if you meet them in real life, they're just, you know, they're shy or they look at their shoes or whatever. Mm. And so maybe that, that's where it comes from. They have a certain amount of nastiness that they can't get out in person. So they get it out indirectly, but face to face, half, never mind half, 90% of the stuff you see on Twitter, no one would dare fucking do face to face, but. Maybe I, that's think, I think that's sort of true. I still wonder, though, that um, I wonder if it's less less true now because of the, the toxic atmosphere that Twitter's created as well. And it could be. It's also just an attention machine, right? And people are too stupid to unplug from the attention machine, or they they don't care. So, like, the only reason that people like Piers Morgan or whatever shock jock you want to choose, how, the only reason they have a career is because people pay attention to them because they are engaged by mm -hmm. them positively or negatively often very negatively but um, it's interesting. Piers, Go on. Piers Morgan, i will say i will give credit to piers morgan he's much cleverer than a troll he's not a troll no yeah because he will say <laughs> this is my theory he will say an opinion from every or for every group in like a rotation so every group or person gets to agree with piers yeah, morgan yeah. twice a year yeah everyone gets a little taste of agreeing with piers and then we're back on rotation and they get to disagree the rest of the time. And, but even the most ardent, you know, a uh, 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 person who's like completely in opposition to Piers Morgan on everything, then he'll come out and say, guns in America seem a bit much, don't they? And everyone will go, yeah. And they get their little agreement cookie. Uh, I agree. Oh, maybe he's not so crazy. And then next week he's annoying them again. So it's much cleverer than a troll because it's like a little merry-go-round, but without, the attention machine, you know, yeah. the attention feeder, you know, these people would starve. And maybe that's bad for journalism, but I, I doubt it. Journalism worked just fine before. <laughs> um, you, it's, so on previous, because um, uh, I haven't got the kind of visual prompt here, but I, I, you, you kind of selected a, a few uh, things which were under two headings. One, were, one was over-tweeting and one was, I think, the anti-vax or anti-lockdown yeah Wait. yeah um, the conspiracy nutters yeah yeah i mean i mean that just plays well let's deal with that one first because that just plays into uh, what you've really just said about the kind of the madness and the vitriol and all the rest of it really 
Yeah, um, well, and also the fact that they're just like a mutually supporting set of, of, of crazies because their whole family or all their friends could be saying to them, you've lost your goddamn mind. But then they can kind of balance that in their heads because there's like 11 people on Twitter who retweet them and go, yeah, you're a freedom fighter. You, you're like a, you're, you're like a resistance fighter in France. You're a genius, you know. And so that, yeah. and the same with the QAnon thing as well. It just drives people away from their families and the world of logic and reality. Um, I think there is a kind of, there's such a need for people to be seen as the kind of the outliers and the rebels and all the rest of it. And I do see everyone wants to be the everyone wants to be the underdog. Mm. Totally. All the rhetorical power now lies with being nominally I'm outnumbered and, and we are the few and, and you know. Yeah. No all the rhetoric now. Yeah, no, definitely. It's a bit like kind of wanting to be cool when you're a teenager. It's it's still in that sort of psyche, I think. You know. Yeah. Very very few lines of argument these days revolve around there's loads of us and we're kind of in charge. So don't worry, it's fine, but let's keep it going, but it's fine. It's, you know, <laughs> it's not interesting to people. <laughs> well, um, and what about the over-tweeters then? Um... If, I, if I get followed by someone, even if they look interesting, if I look on their profile and I see, you know, over 50,000 tweets, 60, 70, 80,000 tweets, I won't follow them back because that's just going to be my whole feed. I can't cope with that. Yeah, yeah. I don't need that direct align into someone's 10 minutes spaced thoughts. Are there like, any sort of well-known culprits for this? Or would you rather well, not? just anyone, like, it, there's, there's a lot of people who are just so online that all they do is like tweet and retweet, tweet and retweet, and they'll do like hundreds a day, mm. which is how they got to the total of, you know, 50k 60k 100k and you know they're free to do that but fucking hell it, i don't think it's i don't think it's a good sign no. i think it's a, like the twitter version of when you see someone has like uh written all work and no play makes jack a dull boy over and over again it's it i do think there are moments where actually um you can just get a you know, a little bit overexcited. So sometimes like during the Dom Cummings interview, I did quite a few tweets from this account and I, I've noticed, not that it, loads of people sort of left us, but I just thought that that's obviously put people off. And then during Love Island, there are one or two people that I still follow, but they did, they were getting a bit carried away and it's like, yeah, this is a bit annoying actually. Yeah, well, it's even madder when it's all from one person. And suddenly yeah. your whole feed is just one person that are completely spamming. And you just think, what what the fuck is this? And it's just like mad, like like it'll be like a thing about sandwiches, and then a thing about a, 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 the the Uyghur genocide, and then a petition about litter in their local area, and then a fucking, and it's just like, it's like having someone else's brain beamed directly into your fucking brain. It's just overwhelming and strange, and it's not good for them either. Their lives have must have gone mad, yeah, because like, I. <laughs> I, 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 I'm self-employed in the daytime and even I couldn't match this rate of output. So what the fuck are they up to, you know? I, um, go on. Well, the difference I was going to say is that if I do look at someone's profile and they've done tens of thousands of tweets, I don't judge it as harshly if their job is nominally to tweet. So that I like, for example, it doesn't matter that Glenn has that many. I don't think he does, but if he did, it doesn't matter because it's his, he's a comedian. It's kind of his job to tweet a journalist, anything where it's your job to kind of have a presence online, mm. then an external financial force is kind of pulling you to tweeting. Whereas if someone is just a normal person, but they live their life so fully on Twitter that all they do is tweet hundreds of thousands of times, then that's not good, you know. Yeah. Like it, it might be fine and it might be that they just, you know, they, their lives exist in such a way that they get a lot from it and maybe they have curated the perfect feed like I aspire to, but a lot of them seem to just be upset all the time if you look at them. like. I think, uh, I mean, just it's, it's probably more allowable if in when it's, there are certain moments on Twitter which are just sort of, uh, there are there are particular events, so the American election, um, some of the Dom, first Dom Cummings, sort of the Rose Garden interview, all the rest of it, where you expect everyone to be sort of at it, basically. Yeah. And it's a yeah. little bit more forgivable then. But yes. trying to create that frenzy outside of wartime, as it were. Yeah. 
So like, here's a good example of the kind of Twitter accounts that have way too many tweets. So I'm, a, I'm, you know, I voted Remain, I'm pro EU, whatever. But, but, but yeah. go, go into the search bar and type in hashtag um, FBP. Yeah, wow. Okay. Yeah. Um, and click on any of the Twitter accounts that come up uh, first, and look how many they've done. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and it'll be 50, 60, 75 k. Um, lots of which will be retweets. They don't they count those. Mm -hmm. You know, they don't all have to be original thoughts. But it's just these people's entire lives, and you just think, do you have like a family, or are, are your family constantly being like, could you stop fucking like, get off your phone, or is this while you're at work? Shouldn't you be working, or do you are you just at home on your own, just like frothing with fury constantly about <laughs> whatever, just the, the the recent act of parliament that da, 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 and and the only people amplifying you are just other people who are equally furious, and it it, it seems like this kind of um, perfect feedback circuit of 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 needless damage to your mental health yeah yeah you don't need to, to i'm going to go on the internet and i'm going to find people who i hate and i'll read their thoughts and, I'll, <laughs> and i'm gonna i'm gonna upset myself <laughs> the unfortunate irony of supporters of freedom of movement who are tethered to their phones but yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah. Listen, I can't believe that the time has, um, has we've, the clock's beaten us. It's really amazing, actually, that I, uh, it's just gone so quickly. Um, where, yeah. where, can, uh, where can people see, hear you next? Bud next. Pod, of course. Bud Pod, every, every week the podcast comes out. Um, where is my next gig, actually? I've got quite a lot of writing to do, which another, is another reason to resent Twitter, because I should be doing other projects. Um, Tuesday, I'm doing a charity gig at the Comedy Store. Oh, um, and the line, the, I've retweeted it a few times. The lineup is mad. 2nd of November, I'll be emceeing at the 100 Club. The 100 Club. No, of course, at the 100 Club. Um, Ooh, Friday, the 5th of November, I'll be in Henley emceeing. Sunday, the 7th, I'll be in Peterborough. There's a few places here and there. Good stuff. Um, and mainly just, yeah, listen to the podcast. And I'm on all the social media because <laughs> i fucking have to be yes you're um uh, we, we've got a little ticker um above our heads which has got your um uh, details on as well as all of our details of course in fact i'll just but i'll just bring up your there you go your biog as we go um definitely uh well thanks so much Peter. hang back in the in the green room so stay with us as I, as I say goodbye to our streamers uh, look, thanks so much for watching us, guys, uh, whether that's been YouTube, Facebook, Twitch, whatever. Please do follow us uh, at LKT Zoom. I hope to have a show with you next week. Um, and then in November, uh, Sajila Kershi is going to be back with us. So we are going to go back to our two hosts, two guests format. So that's going to be a nice booking marathon for us. Um, but it's been uh, very enjoyable tonight. And uh, watch this space uh, for next week. I'll be tweeting out clips of this show I'll be tweeting out news of the next show and uh that's it really guys so uh, we could just both say goodbye to bye to in unison now cheers streamers take care see you soon and thank you martin of course